The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. So I've been talking about um, my work for the past 11 years. Uh, so this has been uh, certainly exciting, but it also was long in duration. So we had to <coughs> sort of stick to the goal. And um, I'll show you also a couple of things. Um, I mean, most of this work has been possible because we have a team of people uh, that contributed to uh, both the design of the robot and the research we're doing on the robot. So um, I've been freely drawing from the work of these other people. Um, I just cited them as uh, the ICAP team uh, because I couldn't list everybody there, but you see a picture later that shows uh, how many people were actually involved in uh, developing this robot. So our, uh, let's say, goal, although we didn't start it like this, is to build robots that can interact with people and maybe one day uh, be um, commercially available to uh, be deployed in a household. Uh, Everything we've done is uh, on the design of the robot has to do uh, with a platform capable of interacting with people in a natural way. And, uh, and this is reflected in the shape of the robot that is humanoid, it's reflected on the type of skills we're trying to implement on the robot, and overall on the design of the platform itself in terms of strength, in terms of uh, sensors, and so forth. Um, there was um, an, let's say, hidden reason we wanted to design a platform for research also. Uh, so when we started, we didn't think of a specific application. Uh, our idea was to have a robot as complicated as possible to give researchers uh, the possibilities of uh, uh, doing whatever they liked. So the robot can walk, has uh, cameras, tactile sensors, um, it can manipulate objects. Uh, we put a lot of uh, effort into this design of the hands, and it's complicated and breaks often. So it's not necessarily the best platform, uh, but it's, the, I believe, the only platform that can provide you with mobile man manipulation and at the same time with a sophisticated color motor system in the eyes and cameras. And, uh, and maybe it doesn't give you lasers, uh, so you have to do with stereo vision. Um, the result um, is this platform that's shown here. Um, this started as a European project, so there was an initial funding that allowed for basically hiring people to design the mechanics and the electronics of the robot. And um, unfortunately, the robot is not very cheap. Um, we, I mean, the, the, the overall, uh, we tried to put the best components everywhere and uh, this is reflected in the cost, which doesn't help uh, diffusion to a certain extent. Uh, in spite of these, we managed to, let's say, sell, which between quotes, because we don't make any profit out of it, uh, 30 copies of the robot. There's still uh, two of them to be delivered this year. Um, so there are at the moment 28 around there. And four of them are in our lab and are used daily by our researchers. And, um, and given the complexity of the platform, we managed at best to build four robots per year. And uh, at best means that we're always late in construction. Uh, we're always late in fixing the robots and that's because I mean, we had a research lab trying also to do, to have this, uh, let's say, more commercial side or uh, support side to the community of users, uh, which in fact doesn't work. I mean, uh, you cannot ask your PhD students to go and fix a robot somewhere in the world. Um, it was striking a bit that um, we managed to actually sell a robot in Japan, uh, and that's because you know, you see Japan as the place of humanoid robots and uh, having somebody asking uh, a copy of our robot there was a bit strange, uh, but nonetheless. And the project is completely open source. Uh, if you go to our website, you can download all the CAD files um, for the mechanics, for the electronics, all the schematics and the entire software uh, from the lowest possible level up to whatever latest research has been developed by our students. Um, 
why we think the robot is special? As I said, we wanted to have hands, and we put considerable effort into the design of the hands. There are nine motors driving each end, and uh, although there are five fingers and uh, 19 joints, which means some of the joints are coupled, so the actual dexterity of the hand is all to be demonstrated, but it, it works to a certain extent. Um, in terms of sensors, it's entirely human-like. We don't have, uh, for instance, as I say, we don't have lasers. Uh, we don't have uh, ultrasound or other uh, fancy sensors that, from an engineering standpoint, can also be integrated. Uh, but we decide to stick to certain uh, subset of possible sensors. Uh, there's one thing that I think is quite unique. Uh, we manage along the way to run a project to design tactile sensors. And so I think it's this one of the few robots that has almost complete body coverage with tactile sensors. There are about 4,000 sensing points in the latest version, and we hope to be able to use them. Um, I mean, you'll see certain things that we started developing, but for instance, we, there was a discussion about manipulation and the availability of tactile sensors. We just scratched the surface in, in that direction. Uh, we haven't been able to do much more than that. Um, as I said, the, we design also the electronics. And uh, the reason for doing this was that we um, wanted to be able to program the very low level of the controller, so the robot. This didn't pay off for many years, but at a certain point we started doing torque control and we started hacking also the low level controllers of the brushless motors. And uh, so it, it paid off eventually because we, that wouldn't have been possible without the ability to write the low level software. Um, not that many people are modifying that part of the software. It's open source also that part, but um, it's very easy to burn your amplifiers if you don't do the right thing at that level. And um, the other thing is that, as I said, the platform is uh, reproducible. And uh, at the moment there is GitHub repository, well, a number of GitHub repositories uh, which contain whatever some a few millions of lines of code, whatever it means. Just means probably that a lot of students are just committing to the repositories, not necessarily that the software is super high quality at this point. Uh, there are a few modules that are well maintained, and that's the low level interfaces, which is something we do. Um, everything else can be of different, in different ranges of uh, readiness to be used, in a sense. Um, well, why humanoids? Uh, there were, uh, at least at the beginning, scientific reasons. Uh, one, paraphrasing uh, Rob Brooks' paper, Elephants on Play Chess, a reason uh, of um, you know, developing intelligence in a robot that has a human shape may give um, an intelligence that is also comparable to humans, um, but also provides a natural, for natural human robot interaction. The fact the robot can move the eyes is very important, for instance. has a very simple face, but is effective in communicating something to the uh, people the robot is interacting with. Um, and also, building a humanoid of a small size, the, the robot is only a meter tall, uh, was very challenging from the mechatronics point of view. Uh, so for us, engineers, was a lot of fun to, the initial few years when we were designing every day was uh, very, uh, very, funny or a um, lot of satisfaction seeing that the robot was growing and being built eventually. Um, the fact that the platform is open source, I think is also important, um, allows for repeating ex experiments across different, in different locations. So we can develop a piece of software and run exactly the same module uh, somewhere else across the world. Um, and this uh, may, uh, again, give advantages in, first of all, debugging was a lot easier. So many people complaining when we, do, when we did something wrong and uh, allowed for uh, also, uh, let's say, shared development. So uh, building partnerships with many people, mostly across Europe because there was funding available so for people to work together. And, um, and this may eventually enable better benchmarking and uh, better quality of what we do. Um, as part of the project, we also develop a, a, a middleware. Um, so uh, 
maybe you may think we've been a bit crazy. Uh, we went from the mechanical design to the research on the robot and passing through the software development. But um, actually, this was uh, a middleware that was started before ROS uh, even existed. Um, and in fact, it was a piece of my work at MIT uh, with uh, a couple of, of the students there in uh, 2001, 2002. Um, so the first version uh, actually ran on COG and uh, ran on QNX, a real-time operating system. Uh, later, we did a major porting to Linux and uh, Windows and Mac OS, which, um, um, so we never committed to a single version. And that because um, we had this community of developers from, from the very beginning, and there was no agreement on what uh, development tool to use and so we say why don't we cover almost everything um, and this part of the software is actually very solid at the moment that that's um, has been you know growing uh, not in size but in in quality in this case so the interfaces remain practically the same and I think the low level byte coding of the messages passing across the network didn't change since the cog time um, everything else changed is completely new implementation now um, and um, but it has uh, portability uh, so as I say the, this was a, a sort of requirement from the researchers uh, not to commit to anything and so we have um, you know developers using Visual Studio on Windows or maybe using GCC on Windows and other developers running whatever IDE available on Linux or Mac OS and this worked pretty well. And there's also language portability. We can link, uh, so all these middleware is just a set of libraries. So we can link the libraries against any language. And uh, so we have bindings for whatever, Java, Perl, MATLAB, and a bunch of uh, other languages. Uh, and this helped um, researchers also to do some rapid prototyping, maybe using Python and <coughs> so forth. Um, as I said, the, the project is open source, so um, you will find, um, if you go to the website, there's uh, a manual, not particularly well taken care of, but <laughs> it, it, it works, at least it works with, with our students, so it, sh it should work for everybody. And, but there are also the drawings, uh, so you can go with drawings like those to a mechanical uh, workshop and you get the parts in return. And then from those, you can also figure out how to assemble the components. Although it's not super easy, it's not something you do just because you have the drawings you do in your basement. Um, I mean, one of the groups in one of our projects tried doing that, and I think they stopped after building um, part of an arm and maybe part of a leg. That, I mean, it was very challenging for them. And uh, you need a, a very, um, let's say, uh, a proper workshop for building the components. So it, it takes time anyway. Um, continuing on the sensors, I, I mentioned that we have um, skin, and um, I'll show you a bit more about that in a moment. Uh, but we also have four source sensors and um, gyroscopes and accelerometers. So if you take all these pieces and you put them together, you can actually sense interaction forces with the environment. And if you can sense interaction forces, you can make the robot compliant. And this has been uh, an important development uh, across the past few years that uh, allowed the robot to move from position control to torque control. And uh, this has been needed, uh, again, to go in the direction of in human-robot interaction. And uh, so the, these are standard for sort of sensors, although we designed them as, as usual. Um, we spent some time in designing the sensors. Uh, and this was a reason of cost. The equivalent six axial uh, for sort of sensor uh, commercially cost, I don't know, 5,000 bucks. And we managed to build it for, for 1,000. So it's, uh, maybe it's not as super rock solid as the commercial component, but it works well. And uh, about the skin, this was uh, a sensing modality that wasn't available. Uh, and again, um, we managed to get funding for actually running a project for three years uh, that designed the skin for the robot. And we thought it was a trivial problem because at the beginning of the project, we already had 
uh, the idea of using capacity sensing. And we actually had a prototype and we say, oh, it's trivial. Then it's, we spent three years to actually engineer it to make it work properly on the robot. So the idea is trivial. Um, so since capacity, capacity sensing is available for uh, cell phones, um, we thought of moving that into a version that would work for the robot. There, there were two issues. First of all, the robot is not flat, so we can just stick cell phones on the robot body uh, to obtain tactile sensing. Um, so we had to make everything flexible so they can be conformed to the surface of the robot. Uh, the other thing is that uh, the cell phones only sense objects that are um, electrically conductive. Uh, that's because the way the sensor is designed. So we had to change that because the robot might be hitting objects that are not, that are plastic, for instance. So what we done was to actually build the capacitors over two layers. Uh, there's an outer layer and a set of sensors that are etched on a flexible PCB that is shown there. And what the sensor measures is actually the deflection of the outer layer, which is conductive, uh, towards the sensors. And in between, we have um, fl uh, another flexible material. And that's another part of the reason why it took so long. We started with materials like silicon that were very n nice, uh, but unfortunately, they degrade very quickly. So we ended up uh, running sensors for a couple of months, and then all of a sudden, they started failing or changing their measurement properties. We didn't know why. We started investigating the all possible materials until we found one that was actually working well. Um, the other solution we had to basically design was the shape of the flexible PCB. Um, so we had the challenge of taking 4,000 sensors and bringing all the signals somewhere to the main CPU inside the robot. And, uh, and of course, you cannot just connect 4,000 wires. So what we done on the back side of the PCB is actually a routing for all the sensors from one triangle to the next until you get to a digitizing unit. And sorry, each triangle digitizes all signals and they travel in digital form from one triangle to the next until they reach a microcontroller that takes all these numbers and sends them to the main CPU. Um, and this saves um, the connection side, and so it actually enables uh, the installation of this, uh, the skin on the robot. So uh, this is a, let's say, industrialized version of the skin, um, and that's a customization we've done for a Barrett arm. And, uh, and those are part of the skin for the ICAB. So the components that we just screw onto the ICAB body and uh, to make them, uh, or to make the ICAB sensitive. This is another solution which is, again, capacitive uh, for the fingertips simply because the triangle was too big, too large for the size of the ICAP fingertips. Uh, but the principle is exactly the same. Uh, it was just more difficult to design the ma this, uh, flexible materials uh, because they, um, they're just more complicated to fabricate on those small sizes. And uh, the result when you combine the four-source sensors and the um, tactile sensors is something like this, which is a compliant controller on the iCub where you can just push the robot around. This is in zero gravity modality, uh, so you can just push the robot around and move it uh, freely. And, uh, and this has to be compared to the complete stiffness in case you do position control. And uh, another thing that is enabled by force uh, control is uh, teaching by demonstration. This is a trivial experiment. We just recorded the trajectory and repeated the, exactly the same trajectory. So it's not, it's not, I mean, you can do learning on top of that, but uh, we haven't done it. It's just to show that uh, the fact that you can control uh, the robot in torque mode uh, enables this type of tasks. So teaching a new trajectory that was never seen by the robot. Um, there's another less trivial a thing you can do, since we can sense external forces, you can do something like this, which is uh, we can build a controller uh, where you keep the robot compliant, you impose certain constraints on uh, the center of mass and the angular momentum, and keep the robot basically stable in a configuration like this one, in spite of external forces uh, being, uh, in this case, generated by a person. Uh, these are, this is part of um, a project that uh, is um, basically try to make the ICAB walk more or less efficiently. 
And uh, as part of the project, we actually also redesigned the ankles of the robots because initially we didn't think of uh, bipedal walking, and so they weren't strong enough to support the, uh, the weight of the robot. And this is basically the same, the same stuff that was shown on the, on the uh, previous videos, just the same combination of tactile and force source sensing. Uh, used to estimate uh, contact forces. We actually added two more force source sensors in the ankles, so we have six overall here in this version of the robot. Um, now, um, as part of this, uh, we also played a bit with machine learning, and uh, this, um, the fact that we, okay, for mapping the tactile information and the force source sensor information to the joints, since they're not localized on the joints of the robot, uh, we have, and also for separating what we're measuring with the sensors from the forces generated by the movement of the robot, by its internal dynamics, we have to have information about the robot dynamics. And this is something we can do or we can build a model for using machine learning. Since we have uh, measurements from the joint position velocities and accelerations and the torques measured from the force torque sensors, we can compute the uh, robot dynamics and uh, this can be done uh, either using a pre, let's say, computer model from the CAD or uh, through learning the model uh, via machine learning. And uh, so we collected data set on the ICAB. Um, in this case, it was a data set for the arm. For the first four joints, we didn't do anything for the wrist. Um, and uh, in this case, we used, uh, uh, we sort of customized a specific method, which is Gaussian processes, to be incremental and also to be computationally bounded in time. So we wanted to avoid the explosion of the computational time due to the in increase in the number of samples. And uh, this was, uh, well, was basically an interesting piece of work because everything we do on the robot, if it's inserted in a control loop, has to have a predictable co computation time and possibly limited enough so that we can run the control loop at reasonable rates. And uh, these are some of the results. And actually, we also compare with uh, sort of other existing methods. This is just to show that uh, the method we developed, which uses an approximate kernel, um, uh, works pretty much as, uh, as well as a standard uh, Gaussian process regression in this case. And it works much better than other methods from the literature. Uh, this was just to have a rough idea that this was entirely doable. Um, also, by shaping the kernel, it's possible to compensate for temperature drifts. Uh, fortunately, the four source sensors tend to uh, change response due to temperature. Uh, not that the lab is changing temperature, but often the electronics itself is heating up uh, around the robot, so it's, ma it's making the sensor uh, read something different. And but it's possible to show that, again, uh, through learning, you can build a compensation also for the um, temperature variations, uh, just by shaping the kernel to include uh, a term that depends on, on time. Uh, this is one example of uh, how we've done machine learning on the robot, although the problem is fairly simple. The problem that is more complicated is learning about objects. So in the, the scenario we targeting is shown here, where we have basically uh, a person that can speak to the robot, tell the robot there is a new object, uh, and the robot is acquiring images, uh, and uh, we hope to be able to learn about objects from, just from this uh, type of images. Uh, this is uh, maybe the most difficult situation. We can also lie objects on the table and just tell the robot to look at a specific object and so forth. Uh, again, the speech interface is, is nice because you uh, can basically also attach labels to the objects the robot is seeing. The um, methods we tried uh, in the recent past, we've done, um, uh, we basically applied um, sparse coding and, uh, and then uh, regularized least square uh, for classification. This was uh, basically how we started uh, a couple of years ago. And more recently, we used uh, an off-the-shelf convolution, <laughs> convolutional neural network. Um, 
and again the classifiers are uh, linear classifiers and uh, these um, I mean has proved to work particularly well uh, but also uh, since we are on the robot we can let's say play tricks one trick that is easy to apply and is very effective is actually uh, you see an object, but you don't have a single frame. You can actually take uh, subsequent frames uh, because the robot may be observing the robots, uh, the objects for uh, a few moments, for seconds, whatever. And in fact, there's an improvement that is shown. This plot there, the one on to the right. Um, uh, if you inc increase the, uh, let's say, the number of seconds you're allowed to observe the object, you improve also performance. And uh, the plot is over the number of classes uh, because we also like uh, to improve on the number of classes that a robot can actually recognize, and, um, which was uh, limited until, let's say, uh, a couple of years ago. But now, uh, with all this uh, new deep learning stuff, uh, seems to be improving quite a lot. And, uh, and that this our experiments in that direction. There's another thing that can be done, which is uh, try to see what happens if we have, uh, since we have, again, the robot interacting with people for entire days, if we collect uh, images in different days, and, uh, and then we can play with uh, different conditions on the testing case. So, uh, for instance, uh, the, the different plots here show what happens if you uh, train and test on um, the current day. So you train cumulatively on uh, up to four days and you test on the last day only. And you see, of course, performance improve as you increase the train set. Uh, conditions may be slightly different from one day to the next. Light may have changed uh, just because there was a more, uh, more a sunny day or a cloudy day. Uh, and uh, the, the other conditions are um, uh, to, to test also on past days uh, or to test on future days, uh, so con where conditions may, may have changed a lot. And in fact, performance is slightly worse in, in that situation. Um, okay, and this is um, a video that shows basically the robot training and uh, some of the um, experiment on uh, testing uh, how the robot well perceives uh, a number of objects. and. Uh, Fortunately, there's no speech here, but uh, there's basically a person talking to the robot and uh, telling the robot what, what is the name for the specific object, then putting another object there, drawing the robot attention to the object, and again telling the name. This is the Lego. Um, it becomes faster in a moment. Okay, and then you can continue training basically like that. And, um, and the video shows also testing uh, while showing a bunch of objects simultaneously to the robot. And here we simply click on one of the objects to draw the robot attention. And um, on the plot there, you see the probability that given objects being recognized uh, as the correct one. Okay, um, I think I have uh, to cut this short because I'm running out of time. Um, another thing I wanted to, to show you is, um, is basically now we have this ability to control the robot. Um, we have the ability to recognize objects. We also have the ability to um, grasp objects in this uh, um, something that uses uh, stereo vision. And uh, in this case, what we wanted to do is to present an object to the robot, no prior knowledge about the shape of the object. We take a snapshot, we reconstruct uh, a stereo pair, we reconstruct the object in 3D, and, and then we apply uh, optimization, constraint optimization to figure out a plausible location for the palm of the hand 
uh, and then uh, they will maximize the uh, ability to grasp the object by closing the finger around the, that particular position. This is our, let's say, definition of power grasp. So put the palm of the hand of the robot in a region of the object that has uh, a surface which has a similar shape or a similar size of the palm itself and with the orientation that is compatible with the local orientation of the surface. And uh, this works with mixed results. So it works with certain objects, doesn't work always. There are objects that are intrinsically more difficult for this procedure. So uh, some of them will only be grasped with 65% probability, which is not super satisfactory. If you run long experiments, you want to grasp three, four objects, uh, you start seeing failures. It becomes boring to actually do the experiments. But these are, so it works well for soft objects, for instance, as expected. Um, we moved a bit into the direction of using the tactile sensors, and, but uh, at this point, we've only uh, been able to try to characterize forces out of the, force, uh, of the tactile sensor measurements. So we're basically taking the fingertip, we have 12 sensors, and we're trying to, and this is another case where we apply machine learning, trying to reconstruct the force direction and intensity uh, from the tactile sensor measurements. And this is basically the procedure, there's a, we take the sensor, we move over a six axial force source sensor, we take the data, and we approximate this uh, again with the Gaussian process. Um, just one last video, uh, if I can. Um, okay. Um, so basically, uh, if we put together all these skills, uh, we may uh, be able to do something useful with the robot. In this case, uh, the video shows uh, a task where the robot is cleaning a table and it's actually using uh, the grass component and, um, and the ability to uh, move the object, to see the object, recognize them and grasp them and put them at a given location, which was pre-specified in this case. So it's not recognized that this is uh, a container, it's just putting things there. And uh, there's one last skill that I didn't have time to talk about, which is uh, recognizing certain objects as tools in uh, one specific object, um, like this one. Gosh. An object like the tool here uh, can actually be used for pulling another object closer. And, uh, and this, um, again, something that can be done through a learning. So we learn the size of the sticks or set of sticks and we also learn how good they are for pulling something closer uh, through experience. Uh, but basically trial and error over many trials. And uh, the result is that it can actually generate a movement that pulls the object closer so they can later be grasped. And, and that basically couple of uh, ideas on how to exploit the object affordances, not just uh, recognizing them, but also uh, knowing that certain objects have certain extra functions, which may end up being useful. Okay, um, just wanted to acknowledge the people that actually worked on all this. Uh, I promise that I uh, will do that, and there's actually a photo around Genoa showing the group that has been mainly working on, uh, on the ICAP project over, uh, let's say, this is the group last year, so uh, there may be more people that just left or uh, some of them moved to MIT. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs>